Welcome to BuffaloRumlinks.com. My name is Matt Warren. I'm joined today by Chris Early from The Finsider, SB Nation's Dolphins blog. Say hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Aw, that's good. And uh, this week we have a th special Thursday night football edition of the Bills and Dolphins rivalry. Uh, I seem to remember some of the special editions of this going very well, like when they went to Toronto and some of the other, I don't know, I just seem to remember the Bills losing a lot of those games. I'm sure they went better for you, uh, Chris, but the anyway. Time, Miami's played uh, two, two Thursday night games, as I recall, recently. They beat uh, Cincinnati last year, and in 2012, they played Buffalo and lost. So. That's right. Okay. Well, see, I, you have a better memory than I do. Let's go back a little bit to um, earlier this season, though, when... The, and E.J. Manuel uh, were able to defeat Ryan Tannehill and the Miami Dolphins. Uh, it, it was a game that was never really in doubt. Uh, the Bills went up 9 nothing early, or well, I guess uh, partway through the, the second quarter on uh, three Dan Carpenter field goals, which has pretty much been the Bills' M.O. this year. If you have Dan Carpenter on your uh, fantasy football team, you're doing well. Um, and then uh, Caleb Sturgis added a field goal to make it 9-3, and, and that was in the third quarter, and it just kind of was like, meh. Uh, until C.J. Spiller returned a 102-yard kickoff return for a touchdown. Um, Mike Wallace comes back with a, a touchdown pass from Ryan Tannehill, but then the Bills are able to march down um, all in the, the, the third quarter here, and uh, the Bills are able to score a touchdown, add a couple of field goals, and it never really felt like it was in doubt. And I, I don't know about um, about you guys down at the Finsider. We, we've been sort of hanging our hat on that, Vicky, for a large portion of the season, as you know, we beat the Lions, we beat the Dolphins. Like, I mean, the Dolphins are a good team, and, and now it seems like the Bills are unraveling a little bit. How have, how have the Dolphins fared the last few weeks coming down the stretch since they they lost to the Bills in Week Two? Um. Well, after that loss, they followed it up with a loss to the Chiefs, which that game was close in the fourth quarter. Um. You look at the final score it was 34 to 15, and you think it's a big blowout. But really, in the fourth quarter, um, the game was something like 15 to 12. There was a safety in there somewhere, but it was it was kind of close like that. And then the Dolphins just couldn't score. They scored a couple um, things like that. So it was um yeah you know there was a lot of issues there. And that's when the whole uh, Joe Philbin going into the Raiders game in London the following week wouldn't come out and say that Ryan Tannehill was his starting quarterback. And, I mean, people got people that don't know Joe Philbin say, oh, he didn't name Ryan Tannehill, but that's just the kind of guy he is. He just says that. Um, he's not a guy that's like, Ryan Tannehill is my guy. He's not, you know, like your Rex Ryan, like, or those other type of, those other type of um, uh, quarterbacks that, or coaches that say, you know, this is my guy or whatever. So he, um, that's just kind of the way he is. And then, um, of course, Ryan Tannehill was the starting quarterback. Kind of went on a little streak there. There was a um, – uh, he had a rough first half against Green Bay. And came back, played well against them in that game. And has kind of played well since. Um, he had a rough game against um, – kind of had a rough game against Jacksonville. I don't kind of blame – the offense as much because there were some miscues. I mean, the first play, they get a uh, first drive, they get a first down, they get nullified by a stupid penalty. It's like uh, the the offensive tackle lined up too far off the line, some kind of dumb stuff that, and it was Brandon Albert at the time. It's not a, you know, something a veteran's not supposed to do. That killed that drive, and then there was a sack, and then the next drive, there was a draw. And then the defense couldn't get off the field, which I found very interesting. Uh, they come out, they destroy San Diego. San Diego runs 49 plays the entire game. 43 plays in the first half. I mean, if you had to guess, you I mean Phillip Rivers, those guys over Blake Bortles and a bunch of rookie receivers, who's going to put up the most? Defense just couldn't get off the field. Now, part of that was they scored a defensive touchdown, and that, of course, means your defense goes back on the field. But you would think they would have done better against a weaker offense. So... And then there was this week against Detroit, which, you know, it was kind of another heartbreaking loss. But, I mean, I, overall, I think Ryan Tannehill played well. So I think overall as a team since that Buffalo game, 
they've kind of got in rhythm a little bit. They've kind of hit a little bit of a stride. They're still a little bit inconsistent, but mm -hmm. they're not kind of the huge question mark that everyone thought they were after that game. Yeah, and when when we looked at the scoreboard and saw the thirty-seven nothing you guys hung on the Chargers, it was it was kind of a wake-up call because the Chargers pretty much handled the Bills early in the season, um, right after they played uh, the Dolphins. In fact, uh, we turned around in the next week we got smoked by the Chargers. They could do no wrong. So to see you guys hang them on that, it was it was kind of interesting. Talk a little bit about Brandon Albert. Uh, we heard that um, he's out for the season. And uh, how are they going to replace him this week uh, at, at tackle? Well, I mean, trying to replace a Pro Bowl player at any position is always tough. But the uh, plan is to move right tackle Juwan James to left tackle and then put, um, so far on the depth chart, uh, is a second-year player Dallas Thomas, who has played guard, uh, out to right tackle. He was the one, he was actually the starting left guard against Detroit when that injury happened. Then he moved to right tackle and they brought in another guard. Uh, and it went about as well as could be expected. I mean, Tannehill was you know, under pressure a lot of the game, but you know they're going to do that. They were doing that even with Albert. So right. um, it was just going to happen regardless. But they only yielded one sack the rest of the game. Uh, and Tannehill had some good plays where he broke out of some some uh, potential t uh, sacks there, but um, overall, I think it went about as well as could be expected. And looking at that game, I mean, there was a drop touchdown, a pass defense touchdown at the end that could have made it 20 to 13 as opposed to having to settle for the field goal. So Miami was still very much definitely in the game, mm -hmm. and they didn't punt until the final drive of the fourth quarter where they went too conservative and ended up, in my opinion, being what cost the game. So even with that lineup in there, with that line, they were still able to move the ball against a very, very good defense. So that was kind of promising. Um, Juwan James has been a career right tackle, but if you read a lot of the stuff about him pre-draft, a lot of it said that he is, um, he's got the athleticism, the size, the length to move to left tackle and can be a good pass blocker. Actually, he, uh, most of the stuff I read said his weakness was in run blocking, which is what you kind of expect more from a right tackle. So Dallas Thomas, you know, he they slated him in to be a starting guard this season, and that's where he played when he was when he was drafted. He played uh, left guard at Tennessee. Um, then, but he did start out at left tackle. Um, he got completely abused by uh, Gerald McCoy in a preseason game, and just looked completely awful. And he got benched after that. Well, he came in in backup duty, and he's actually he was actually, from what I've read and from what I've seen of the game so far, he actually outplayed center Samson Satelli and right guard Mike Pouncey in that game. Now, granted, Pouncey was going up against uh, Indama Kinsu most of the time, which you know is going to happen, but he did pretty well. But he does have the athleticism to move to uh, outside of tackle. The big question mark there is going to be. Um, from my perspective, thinking about this, I was thinking about this uh, today. The um, uh, Juwan James can handle speed rushers. I think he's going to be fine uh, going up against a guy like Jerry Hughes, and he did well going up against um, Mario Williams in the first matchup. The I think Dallas Thomas will be fine with some speed rushers. The difference with him is I think he lacks. Uh, he's going to struggle against power, and Mario Williams is a guy that can convert speed to power. He can come off the edge and just. Instead of just blowing by you, he can bull rush into you. So it, that's going to be a question mark. And, and one of the things that the the Bills, uh, the, the Dolphins actually were able to do earlier this year is hold the Bills um, right around their um, their their average. The, the Bills had four sacks in the first game. They've got 36 sacks, I believe, through their nine games. Which is what four four games? So uh, they they were able. To, let's let's go back and look and see who had them. It was. Uh, Stephon Charles, Jerry Hughes, Kyle Williams, and Mario Williams. Now, Marcel Darius has been an absolute beast. He's got 10 sacks so far this year from the defensive tackle position. Um, the shakeup on the Dolphins' offensive line have to be have to be at least a little bit worrisome to Ryan Tannehill first and foremost, but to, to Dolphins fans and Dolphins coaches. Do you, 
Do you see that affecting their game plan, changing it up? Because Mike Wallace is, isn't is generally seen as a guy that's going to like go across the middle or anything like that, right? He's usually a deep threat guy that something would be like have, having to develop develop um, in the pocket. Is Are they going to have to change their game plan on offense to accommodate for the Bills' pass rush with that reshuffled offensive line? Um, I think they're... They've kind of started doing a little bit more of that over the course of the season just naturally. They've taken away some of the deeper passes, some of the deeper drops that Hannah Hill's taken, um, doing more quick passes, more short to intermediate game. Uh, the big thing that's going to help there is the emergence of rookie receiver Jarvis Landry. Um, he really wasn't much of a factor early in the season aside from um, kickoff returns. He was getting you know a few targets a game. It's now to the point where I believe he is the focal point of the offense. I think one of the beat writers mentioned that in one of their articles, and uh, it's looking like that, that. He is the primary target now. Uh, he received more targets than all of the other receivers this last game. Um, it's looking like he's the guy that Tannehill's looking for, which is going to help out because um, what he does best so far is gain yak. He's going to catch the ball short and gain yards after that. So – they're going to use that type of game to neutralize some of the pass rush. They did that against the um, did that against the Lions. And any team that has a uh, pretty good defensive front that can get pressure without having to blitz, that can leave guys back in the secondary, they're going to run those plays to guys like him. They're going to run those um, slants, quick hitches to Mike Wallace, wide receiver screens, things like that. Um, and then they're going to take their shots downfield when they can. Um, I think early on you're going to see you're going to see them attempt to run the ball more. I think you're going to see them do the short passing, just to see how the tackles hold up. If they start playing well, then you're going to see more um, more of the, the deeper passes, deeper drops from Tannehill. But I think at first they're going to start with with the shorter stuff. So um, they've kind of been doing that, and it's been working. Um, you know, I mean, we've watched the Patriots for years, dink and dunk teams down the field and it works with success but to do that you have to have receivers that can create after the catch and Miami's never really had that or at least not in Tannehill's two seasons or this is third season so with Landry stepping up doesn't have the touchdowns but he's got the catches he's becoming that part of the offense so look for him early and often to get those short passes and then try to create they're going to put him in position to do that okay on um on offense, what do you expect the Bills to be able to do uh, to the Miami Dolphins defense? They rank pretty highly in uh, in points scored against them, uh, yards against them, and in a lot of the different categories. How how can the Bills attack that defense? Um, well, the the main thing about the Dolphins defense is it has improved because we've gotten players back. Um, when we played the Bills in Week Two. Uh, Koamisi, our starting middle linebacker, was out, and he's a good run stuffer. His replacement, Jason Trusnick, is a primary special teamer. He's the special team's captain. That's what he does. That's what he excels at, but he's a kind of a liability as a starting linebacker. Um, we lost Ellerby in the first game to an injury, lost him for the season. Uh, Second-year player Jelani Jenkins stepped up and that was his first start but since then he's kind of emerged into a budding star he's uh, racking up tackles he's making plays he's had three and a half sacks I think two forced fumbles uh, PFF has him graded pretty highly in coverage so he's turned out to be a starting caliber player so those two players the linebacker position has actually what we all thought was going to be a weakness going into the season has now actually become I don't want to say a strength but less of a, a problem to worry about um, Deion Jordan is back who adds a kind of plays a jack of all trades in some of our defensive fronts where he moves inside uh, rushes from the edge they even had him in man coverage in the slot on Calvin Johnson this past week so they use him in a variety of ways I don't think you'll see that against uh, Sammy Watkins simply because he's just a lot quicker and you know they use the size thing there for Calvin Johnson but they'll use him in a variety of ways and then Rashad Jones our safety has come back uh, from suspension, so he's added a new dynamic. He's got two picks, a sack. He's getting like six to eight uh, tackles a game, so he's playing well. So I don't know what the Bills are going to be able to do well, simply for the fact as I don't know how the Bills look without the primary running backs. Um, I know that Spiller's out for the season. Fred Jackson played this past week. I, from what I read, he didn't 
do very much or didn't play well. I'm not sure how, from what I read, how to take it. But it may have been he was limited due to injury. So if he's back healthy, he always gives us a problem. Mm-hmm. I think what you want to see is they're just going to try to get um, – if I'm the Bills, I try to – Miami secondary is pretty good, but they play off the line of scrimmage, and they play – kind of a, I don't want to say prevent defense, but they're basically like, they're not going to press you. They're not going to get up in your face and make you beat them downfield. They're going to give up the short stuff. So I expect kind of what happened the first game is utilize the short dump off passes to to the playmakers and let them do their stuff in space. Um, That's how I would attack this defense, especially when you got a guy like Sammy Watkins, who is dynamic after the catch. I mean, that's what I mean. I watched the game, the the first Bills game on um, on DVR. I didn't get a chance to watch it live, and even then, I was like, "Why are you giving this guy seven yards of cushion? What are you doing?" All he was doing was just running slants and crosses and getting open, and it was killing us. So I don't know that you'll see. I think they'll pressure him a little bit more than that, uh, force him to work to get open. But I still think you're going to see that. Um, Cortland Finnegan is out. He didn't practice this week. He was injured last week, and from what I've read, it's probably going to be something that's going to keep him out, if not the rest of the season, several games. So second-year player Jamar Taylor is going to be getting his first start. You've seen what If you've seen that Brent Grimes interception, you see what he can do. He's got four picks in three weeks. Um, he's playing very well. He's, he's becoming a guy that teams are going to th- – despite him having a good reputation as, as a good cornerback, team still threw at him. Now he's becoming the guy that teams are throwing away from. So if I'm the Bills, I line Sammy Watkins and everybody else you want to get the ball up on the other side just to face the less experienced players and take your chances there because if you're throwing at Grimes, you're going to win some, but you're also probably going to lose some. And in the last game, the Bills, I don't think, had a turnover. But if you start throwing the ball to him and he gets a pick or two, then that can change the outcome of the game. And so I I suspect they'll stay away from him and attack the the second-year guys. Yeah, the biggest change between the first game and the second game, if, at least for the Bills, I mean, yeah, the running game is going to look completely different. That Bryce Brown received a ton of targets in the passing game and got some carries, including ahead of him a big fumble on the goal line against the Chiefs. But um, Fred Jackson was limited because of injury. Uh, he played the first half and didn't see their snap the rest of the game. I don't, uh, maybe the last play or something like that. Um, and and uh, he was at. Uh, he, remember, he was a guy that was uh, chipping on Cameron Wake a lot in that first matchup that won't be around for this second one. Well, he'll be around. It's just a matter of, of how much he's actually going to be playing. Um, at least in uh, last week's game, and I'm with only a, a couple days to recover, I, I highly doubt he'll do anything more than he did against the Chiefs. Uh, he was was in on a third downs to do that kind of pass blocking, and he took a couple passes, dump offs on third downs, and things like that. But he's not going to be the guy in there getting you know 15 carries a game or, or more like that against the Dolphins this week. That you're going to see Bryce Brown and, and Booby Dixon getting most of those carries. Uh, and then of course the big, the other big change is Kyle Orton is in instead of EJ Manuel. But but against the Dolphins, EJ Manuel had an efficient day. Again, you said no turnovers. That's the recipe for. Except for whoever is a quarterback for the Bills. If, if they can manage the game, get it to the playmakers' hands like Sammy Watkins, Robert Woods, um, uh, things like that, that's how they're going to win this game. Uh, do you have any questions for me, Chris, before I let you go? Um, I had some earlier, and I have forgotten them now. Um, what... Um, that's what happens when you have kids. You just really forget stuff. Um... It's late too, you know. It's, um, it's half the, given the thing we mentioned about Kyle Orton, um, do you think at any point in time that the Bills will go back to EJ Manuel for any reason? A lot of people wrote him off, kind of. Oh well, he's been benched, but a lot of that was, you know, the coaches had to win now. Mm-hmm. So let's assume, let's say the Bills make the playoffs, win a playoff game make it to the conference uh, or the divisional round or whichever. Sounds awesome. Sign me up. So let's say that happens. Do you think that they would say, all right, we, we, we earned enough good favor, we can go back to manual now? Or do you think that he's just he's going to be you know, kind of like Mark Sanchez was in New York, just when you're gone, you're gone? Well, I, I don't think it's necessarily going to be like that because he's going to be on the roster at least in th- through next year, I would think, just because he's cheap. But – I don't think if the Bills go to the playoffs with Kyle Orton as a quarterback for the first time in a decade and a half that they're going to let Kyle Orton 
not starting quarterback of the team next year. So I, th I think those are kind of two different questions. I, I do see several scenarios in which E.J. Manuel could become the starter for the Buffalo Bills, uh, even if you take out injury. Um, if Kyle Orton leaves, if you get a different coach coming in, there's a lot of different um, kind of variables E.J. Manuel is going to be on the team in training camp next year. He's going to be on the team in the preseason. And he's probably going to be on the team next season. And lots of stuff can ha happen now and then with a new owner, with Kyle Orton, who could be a free agent if he wants to be this offseason, by the way. He's got an opt-out of his contract. He's making $5.5 million next year. And if he thinks he can get more than that, he could just be like, all right, I'm going to go get more than that. And if the bills can't match it or won't match it or whatever... I there's lots of scenarios where that could happen. I don't see a, a scenario this season where Kyle Orton gets benched for EJ Manuel on purpose. Um, if if EJ Manuel starts this season, I would think that it's because of an injury. Um, do you think how has the injury to CJ Spiller affected his? Uh, if I'm not mistaken. He's a free agent this year. How has that affected his contract negotiations? Is, is he still looking for free agency? Is he still looking for big money, even though he's coming off a, a, an injury like that? He's another guy that can opt out of his contract, um, and everyone pretty much anticipates him doing um, I, I want to say it's $6 million that he's owed next year because he's on one of those old uh, first-round pick contracts. And so if, if he does opt out of a $6 million contract, I mean – with the running backs in the NFL now, I don't know if he's going to get more than that from another team. He might, uh, he might just because of his versatility and what people think they can do with him. He's, I'm sure he's very talented, and I'm sure he's very confident in that talent. So, if he wants to, he can opt out. Everything before this said, yeah, he's probably going to opt out. I don't know if that's the case anymore just because of the injury. Um, he's on IR designated to return. We're hoping he's going to be back for the playoff run. Uh, so just <laughs> just throwing that out there, too. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of interesting. A, lo a lot of Dolphins fans are thinking this game is kind of a must-win, which in a sense it is. I mean... It is. It, it's a must-win. It's, it's, it's not a make-it-or-break-it game. It's... Well, we're not exactly going to make it, but it could definitely break it. If if the Dolphins go down two games in the division to the Bills, if they go down um, a tiebreaker to the Bills, there's just probably not a whole lot of coming back from that. And if the Bills go tie the Dolphins and then they're back into the scrum, well, they would be behind the scrum. They already are down a tiebreaker to the Chargers and the Chiefs. Now they'd be tied with the Dolphins and at mercy of the division tiebreaker. I, it just becomes such a huge... It's a break game. It's not necessarily a make it game. That's how I've been terming it. Yeah, I think uh, you know. I think a lot of the Dolphins fans were thinking this Detroit game was a must win. Which one of the um, some guy I read or watched a video of said basically Miami needs to go two and two over this next stretch in order to kind of stay in the playoff run, which they kind of predicted. Um, just looking at it, you would think. Uh, lose to Detroit based on record, uh, lose to Denver, who we play next, and then, you know, we've got to beat the Jets, which, you know, you never can count them out regardless of record. It's a division game. I mean, the Patriots have been destroying people over the past few weeks, yet they, they took a blocked kick in the final seconds to secure a win over Geno Smith. So, you know, who knows how that was going to go. So basically – if the Dolphins are going to go two and two in the stretch, they have to win the division games, which are the most important. So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Um, the Dolphins are going all Aqua this week, um, Aqua jerseys, Aqua um, pants. Like they did the Monday night game against the uh, uh, the Chicago Bears when Ricky Williams ran for like a bajillion yards. So um, that's just one of the things that's come out about this week. Um, Again, I'm not a big fan of the short week. It's nice that I get to watch them on Thursday night, and, and they're going to be a primetime game. But, you know, I, with all the injuries and stuff, and that's on both sides. I mean, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys would love to have. I know Sammy Watkins, I said, had like, groin problems, and then, you know, Fred Jackson. Of course, you'd like to have more time to re let those guys rest before facing a big division game that, like you said, could be a game that breaks either team. So, it's going to be tough, and it's going to come down to a you know a battle of wheels. And, and I think both defenses are going to stuff the run. I don't think they're going to have a lot of success um, on either side. I, I know you guys can stop the run. Miami can stop the run. 
then it's going to come down to the quarterbacks, who plays the safest, who plays the most efficient, and it's going to be interesting to watch. So who knows? <laughs> All right, we've been talking with Chris Early from the Finsider.com. Uh, as much as we don't like Dolphins or Dolphins fans, you should go read their stuff because it'll give you valuable insight on how the Bills are going to beat the Dolphins on Thursday night. Thanks, Chris. All right, you have a good night. You too.